And now on the line is Saoirse Brady, who is the Executive Director of the Irish Penal Reform Trust. Saoirse, welcome to the programme. Thanks for having me, Darren. Uh, Saoirse, I got in touch with you to this interview today mainly because I have an interest in one particular area of your work and we can maybe talk about that in a few minutes. First of all though, uh, this is my first interview with your organisation uh, and I understand that you are only a couple of weeks in, in your in your job. Uh, could you start off with telling our listeners on Near FM a bit about your background please Saoirse and then tell us more about who the Irish Penal Reform Trust are? Okay, thanks very much. Um, well, myself, I've uh, I've been working in the NGO sector now for I'd say nearly two decades, and um, I would have worked with FLAC, the Free Legal Advice Centres, that I'm sure some of your listeners are familiar with, and I would have worked on issues around social welfare and um, direct provision for asylum seekers and other human rights uh, issues like that. Um, and then I worked with the Children's Rights Alliance, which is a membership organisation. Um, of over 140 members and actually the Irish Penal Reform Trust is a member of the Children's Rights Alliance but they have a campaign to ensure that Ireland is the best place in the world to be a child. So um, I recently took up the the position uh, of Executive Director with the Irish Penal Reform Trust um, and I was really excited to do so because it's a great organisation with it's a small dynamic team there's only five of us but um, I was really familiar with its work. And actually, I saw loads of linkages between the work I had been doing with the Children's Rights Alliance, particularly around child poverty and disadvantage, um, educational disadvantage, and then um, the penal system uh, and looking towards penal reform and how we can actually stop people ending up in the criminal justice system in the first place. But I suppose the Irish Penal Reform Trust then, it is... Um, it was founded in 1994 and it was a group of concerned citizens that came together because they were worried about the prison system, the probation system and what was happening for, for people once they entered that system. Um, you know, so IPRT has been campaigning for years for a fair and just and humane system for people um, once they enter prison or also when they leave it. Um, so, for example, when they're in prison, one of the big campaigns that IPRT would have run was around slopping out. So this is where there wasn't um, toilet facilities or in-cell sanitation in the cells where um, people in prison were. Um, and, you know, that ran into the hundreds um, 10 years ago, say. And, you know, it's very degrading to think that people were given a bucket and told to use that and keep it in your cell with you all night and then have to hand it over in the morning and slop out, um, as it's called. But I suppose one of the big successes is um, that IPRT would have pushed for is having that in-cell sanitation. And um, earlier this year, the number was 36. And that was January this year. 36 people still had a slop out. So that's still not good enough. But it is much better than what went before. And we know that the Irish Prison Service are actually putting in place um, further improvements, particularly in Limerick, where this is still an issue in Limerick Prison. Um, and hopefully, um, I hope maybe next time I'm talking oh. to you, there won't be anyone who has to slap out. But um, that that would be one example. That's and then great I mentioned news, when people, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, yeah. When people leave prison, um, you know, that they very often encounter um, issues, particularly around gaining access to housing or employment. And one of the other campaigns, that isn't finished either, um, I would say, but where IPRT did have a lot of successes. And obviously, I can take no credit for this because I'm new into the job. Um, so it's great to be able to talk about the successes of the organisation um, and, and promote it, but uh, would be around spent convictions. So this is where somebody um, would have a criminal conviction and they would have to disclose it, whether they're applying for a job or for housing or for travel. Um, and it might be for quite a minor offence, like a motoring offence, but it was always on your record as such. And Ireland was one of the only uh, countries in the EU who did that didn't have a way to kind of expunge that or after a certain length of time, it wouldn't be, um, it, it wouldn't matter anymore or you wouldn't have to disclose it. Um, mm. So IPRT would have campaigned very hard for that system to be brought in. So in 2016, there was a piece of legislation passed to say that um, if it was after seven years, you wouldn't have to disclose it for certain offences. We're still carrying on that work, particularly for young people aged 18 to 24, because the science now shows that actually 
young people under 18 as well, but 18 to 24 year olds, they don't always understand the consequences of their actions or something might have happened to them before. Um, and, you know, it's had a really adverse impact on them um, and it's mm. caused them to, to do something that they, they, you know, wouldn't have done otherwise. Um, and, you know, you have to give people a second chance. And we really are all about this in IPRT. We want to ensure people have those second chances that they don't go on to reoffend, that they're supported not to reoffend um, if they've done so in the first place. In an ideal world, nobody would offend in the first place. So we also want to look at the systems that can be put in place to deter people and stop people and support them to not have to go down any particular road. Um, so that's, that's kind of a snapshot of IPRT. We do a lot of um, advocacy work. We, um, are, we base all of our advocacy on evidence. So we really do a lot of research. We talk to colleagues. We, we talk to the politicians. We get the latest figures that we can. And we would work in partnership with some of the statutory agencies to really try and improve things. Like we're really a critical friend, I would say, mm. to people like the Department of Justice and the Irish Prison Service. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, we move on. We talked about a couple, about a couple of your other areas now. I understand that earlier this week you had an important uh, all island seminar in Northern Ireland, didn't you? Could you tell me more about what that was about, Sersha? We did indeed. So um, we were really lucky that the Community Foundation of Ireland and Community Foundation Northern Ireland came together and they've created an all island fund for organisations on each side of the border to work together on particular issues. So we've been working with our sister organisation up in the north called NIACRO. Um, and we, we decided to focus um, on exchanging knowledge. So we had like a knowledge exchange seminar up in Stormont, actually, um, lovely surroundings on uh, Tuesday. And we brought together over 60 stakeholders from all over the island to talk about women in prison or women who have experience of prison whose children have been taken into care because this is a group that's often forgotten about, I would say. And when we look at the figures, um, the number of women in prison are always much smaller than the number of men in prison. And, you know, um, we had the governor of the Docus Centre, the, the women's prison in Dublin there this week, and he was telling us, you know, just how many women were in prison this year. Or, or actually this week, sorry, I mean. So, you know, in the DOCUS, there were about 130 women and there was one baby there because they do have facilities for um, a woman to have a, a baby while she is um, in prison. Um, uh, but basically, the, when we look at how many of those might be mothers, it's usually about three quarters of them generally are, are mothers. And now there might be mothers to you know, young children, or they might be adult children as well. We don't have an accurate picture of exactly how many women are mothers to young children. And this is important because very often the mother is the primary carer. They're the ones who are looking after their child. And in some instances, there are some mums who've gone in to prison and their children are already in care or in, you know, in contact with uh, social services or the care system. But many mothers, um, when they go into prison, they will ask, family members to take in their their um, children or sometimes the, the state will have to take them into care and some of the things we heard this week were really heartbreaking we heard we, we were delighted to have um, a number of women come up from the SEAL project the Brio project within the SEAL project which is a great organization that works with women who have experience of criminality and addiction and a, a number of the women came up and they shared their their thoughts on this and the, some of the things that, that came up and they talked about were things like just not knowing day to day where your child is not knowing who they're with what they're doing not knowing if they're sick or they have a health need and you're not consulted for your consent then and you know mm -hmm. somebody else talked about how they didn't want their kids to see them in prison they didn't want them to come and visit but um, they were in care and they, they were brought into the prison to see their mum and they just didn't feel comfortable with that. And they felt like they, the, the mum felt like she should have been consulted in all of this. And um, so we, we learned a lot from hearing from the women. We also, as I mentioned, we heard from Martin Galgi from uh, the DOCUS Centre just about um, what supports are in place within the DOCUS Centre for, for women. 
Um, and we heard from the Northern Ireland Prison Service and they've recently issued a strategy around um, family relationships and how they can support those. And, you know, some of the things that, like really practical things came out of this around, you know, just um, women and their children being told what's happening in language they can understand and not in, you know, uh, oh. kind of jargon or, 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 you know, like the language of the court, for example. And that isn't always accessible. So just so that they would know what was going on. Um, they also talked about, like, could they have greater contact with their children? And actually, it was interesting. Some of the, the positives um, that came out of the pandemic were that, uh, you know, women and men in, in prison as well um, were given access to video calls for the first time, you know, because before that it would have been telephone calls and sometimes some cells do have phones in them, but some would be on a landing. You don't have any privacy. They're very short calls, like six minutes. Um, whereas with the video calls, you might get half an hour and, you know, the, the women could put on, and I'm sure we've all played around with Zoom and put on different backgrounds. So they could put on a neutral background so it didn't look like they were in prison. And the child also didn't have to travel and go through security in prison, um, which can be very frightening for, well, I was going to say for very young children, but for anyone going into the prison, it can be, um, you know, it, it can be a bit intimidating. Um, so the women you know, said that they could, like, engage with their child when they were doing their homework, that their child was much more comfortable because they were in their home environment. Um, and it was a much more natural interaction than either a phone call or sometimes coming into the prison. That's not to say that women didn't want to see their children. Of course they did. Um, and we're really happy that the Irish Prison Service have lifted some of the restrictions recently so there's no longer screens um, at you know, during the visits, mm. you still have to wear a mask, but it's much easier to hear and understand people again. Like we've all encountered that ourselves during the pandemic, going into shops and finding it hard to hear the other person. So you can only imagine what that's like when you have a limited time, it's pressurized and you're trying to talk to the people that you love, but you don't see that often. So, you know, we, we heard a lot on, on um, Tuesday and we are going to produce a short summary report and, you know, put some of these recommendations down and try and engage with, you know, the Irish Prison Service, with the actual prisons themselves, with the Child and Family Agency, TUSLA, just around some of these things that came up. Um, and we heard about what some of the children and there's been some research done in England um, around what women and children want, you know, when a mum goes to court. They, they want to be asked how they are. They want to, you know, if the child asks, do you want to visit your mum now? And they say no because they're angry or upset. They want somebody to ask them again in a week or two because they might have changed their mind. I suppose mm -hmm. the other thing I would say about it that was really kind of thought-provoking, and I think this happens on both sides of the border, um, you know, we're not unique here, but women are usually committed for less serious crimes you know, so they're non-violent um, offences. And it's usually for less than 12 months, like the vast majority of them are for 12 months. Or in some instances, they might be held in remand, they might be put into custody, which disrupts the whole family. Child may have to go and stay with relatives or they may have to go into care because there's no other option. And then they don't get sentenced in the end. Um, mm -hmm. And anecdotally, what we hear is judges sometimes try, they think that, women need to go in for their own protection because a lot of the women that end up in prison have been subject to domestic violence, sexual abuse. They may have an addiction issue, a mental health issue, and I know that's something that you're particularly interested in. Mm. Um, and, you know, that, that, <laughs> not saying this doesn't happen for men, but th this does happen a lot for women. Um, we need better evidence. We need better data to be able to kind of tailor the responses for this. But we also need to be looking at the alternatives. We need to be looking at whether or not women could serve community uh, service orders instead of going to prison. Could they engage with programs that would actually support them if they have an addiction or a mental health issue? Um, we need to stop criminalizing people for things that um, could, uh, you know, could be dealt with in more empathetic and humane ways and actually it would just break that cycle of offending or reoffending, and it would have such a positive impact on the women, their children, society as a whole, 
we really need to start thinking about it from that point of view, I would say. Yeah, I'd like to maybe come back with you at some stage in the future, maybe do a follow-up interview on uh, women in prison and, hope, and hopefully there would be a more better alternatives uh, for mm-hmm. most of them. You just to move on, you touched on it there, addictions and uh, mental health issues. We talked a bit about that now, it's okay. At the start of the interview, I said uh, the area of your work in the Irish Pain and Reform Trust where I have most interest in, because I believe it is a huge issue, is the issue of prisoners with mental health and addiction problems mm-hmm. and not being treated as humanely as much as possible by the state. As I said, I, I believe this is a huge issue. But, but, but could you tell me more, Saoirse, about, uh, about it from your viewpoint in the Irish Pain and Reform Trust? Yeah, I suppose, like, you're right, that this is a huge issue. And, you know, again, we don't have accurate stats, we don't have accurate data, but the estimates are that um, people in prison, you know, have maybe more, they're, they're more than four times likely to have a mental health issue. Um, you know, so you end up having somebody going into a prison service that isn't equipped to deal with their issue they may sometimes they may not even be diagnosed and we know that there are people waiting for um you know months or years for to to get treatment to get diagnosed to get to get that first appointment that's the same in the community as it is in the prison but you know um like for example in the midlands prison um there was a there was a report published by the office of the inspector inspector of prisons um just last month and it looked at midlands prison and over half of the people there were on a waiting list to access psychology services in prison you know and Mm. the waiting list for triage so like just to see what level they were at was anywhere between six months and a year and a half Mm. so you know that that is really worrying and the other thing that we hear about is that um People with mental health difficulties, prison officers um, are not, it's not their job as such to have to deal with that medical side of things as well. Um, So sometimes what you'll hear is that uh, people with mental health issues, particularly those with maybe more serious mental health issues that end up in the the prison system, uh, are often put in isolation or they call it restricted regimes, um, that, that's a technical term, but they're put in isolation um, for their own protection or the protection of others. But then we don't know how long they might stay there, you know, because if, if <laughs> you don't have access to services, if they're there waiting um, to access a doctor or a psychologist and, you know, they haven't been given a diagnosis or we don't know what's going on with them, then there's no indication of how long they might be in there and that's that's really mm-hmm. concerning you know because that could you know potentially exacerbate their issue as well and you know it is unfair in prison staff that they are trying to manage this as well as all the other things that they have to manage within the prison system but there just isn't enough staff to deal with this in terms of the the psychologists that are needed within the prison system. So, you know, that is something that would be very um, concerning to us. And obviously you touched on it there yourself, but like often people with a mental health need may also have addiction issues. And, you know, there's a whole thing around dual diagnosis. Mm. And, you know, if somebody has an addiction issue, can they actually access the mental health service that they need or vice versa? Um, and, you know, it is it is very problematic. Um, so we really need to consider who is going into our prisons. Again, doing an assessment of whether or not somebody should be going into the prison if they have a mental health need. Is there a more appropriate place for them to go? You know, did the mental health issue, um, did it cause what happened to them or what they what they did? Um, we need to think about being fair and humane. And, you know, in other jurisdictions, they do have things like mental health courts. They do have things like drugs courts where, you know, an assessment is done to see if it would be more appropriate for somebody to receive treatment in the community. Mm. and monitor them while they're getting that treatment and you know they would probably have to engage with probation etc but it's not that you're just letting them off um in the community by themselves you are supporting them you are ensuring that they have access to the services that 
their need that will help them to cope or help them to get better in some instances or you know provide them with with other ways to 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 live um so it, it is something that we really have to think about and um, we need to take a step back you know because as well treatment programs like f- from the state's point of view they're much more cost effective and they're much more cost effective in the long run because people who are supported um to deal with an addiction to deal with their mental health issue in an appropriate way oh. very often don't go on to reoffend so you know we we, we need to to really step back and think about this um, and and what we're doing. And we need to reduce the numbers in prison. You know, we need to look at what the offences are. You know, people who are in, you know, who are sent to prison for minor offences. Would would we all be better served by those people being able to serve a community service order? Of course we would. So we need to really step back and think about those kind of things be pragmatic about it but also look at it from a human rights point of view Um, you're depriving somebody of their liberty that should be a last resort and it should only be in the most serious cases yeah, I had a couple of follow-up questions typed up to ask you about this area, but you've kind of, you've already answered them. Just uh, a couple, one or two things on this issue. Um, like I, I've discussed this in a couple of radio interviews over the years with people in kind of public health uh, areas, but addiction issues officially, according anyway to the DSM, which is kind of like the the the, the directory of mental health illnesses, like. Addiction issues are mental health issues, according to DSM. There's just a legacy of treating us mm-hmm. all, if, uh, of treating them separately. So if you if you look at it like that, and I, I I think most people don't look at it like this, and it's 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 because there's a legacy of separately. But if you look at it like that, everyone who has a serious addiction has a meant that addiction is a mental health issue. Yeah, I I think there should be um. Like people who have mental health issues, there should be more therapeutic uh, environments for them, you know. Yeah. You know. That's true. And just to say, there is a high level task force. So, Minister of Justice Helen McEntee did commission a high level task force um, last year uh, to look at this issue around mental health and addiction. And they're due to report this quarter so round about now so we are looking out for that and we hope that they will make recommendations the person who's chairing that task force is um kathleen lynch who was the former minister of state for mental health so obviously knows the issues quite well mm. so we would hope that there'll be some positives come out of that and the other thing that's going on that we think really presents an opportunity around this is a review of the prison rules that hasn't been they haven't been reviewed since 2007 but again we you know we have a better understanding of mental health issues i'd say even since 2007 so we need to be looking at the prison rules and how they apply particularly for people with um maybe a mental health diagnosis or who are awaiting a mental health diagnosis and um and and the addiction side of things too so that i think those things provide a real opportunity to try and um, improve conditions for, for those particular cohorts of people who are in prison. Mm, I'll keep an, uh, an eye out for those two reports on, um, over the next mm-hmm. few weeks or months and uh, I'll come back to you uh, uh, again over the next few weeks or months to talk about them, okay? Great. Thank you so much.